you have a Bible, if you want to go ahead, open up with me to Acts chapter 2. We're going to continue in this series we've been doing on the book of Acts. Uh, and as we turn to the book of Acts, uh, I've got a picture that I want to show you. This is a picture that is hanging up in my home office. Uh, there are two rooms that I have the authority in our house to decorate. One is the garage, and it's really well decorated with flags and weed eaters and lawn equipment. The other one, a couple years ago, we built a home office, and my wife gave me the authority to decorate my own office at home. And so I looked for a while at, at finding the right thing to hang up on the wall, and finally I found this. And it's kind of hard to see what it is with this projector. It is a piece of valuable abstract art. Um, can, can anybody tell what it is? It's, it's abstract art. It's a, it's a scene from early in my life, a sports moment that really was one of the most iconic moments of my childhood. Can anybody tell? If you squint the right way? Anybody? Yell it out. If I hear the right answer, you'll get a big thumbs up from me. Basketball. So you see a basketball net. On the far, on this side of the screen, you might be able to make out a figure. And, and he looks kind of like... Uh, Jordan. So this is an abstract painting of the 1988 uh, slam dunk contest when Michael Jordan did the free throw line dunk. So if you squint long enough, you'll finally see it. It's one of those things that you like go to the mall and you can see it. It's an abstract painting. I, I wanted to move beyond the days when I had posters in my bedroom. And so I decided to get an abstract piece of art to hang up on the wall. It's Michael, so Michael Jordan's over here. Anybody see him yet? Raise your hand if you see him. Okay, if not, you can come to my house and stare at it until you actually see it, but I promise that's, that's what this is supposed to be. Anyway, that's what they told me when I bought it. Uh, here's the reason that I bought it. I, I did not grow up a fan of Michael Jordan. I recognized his greatness. When this dunk happened, I was nine years old. I remember watching the slam dunk contest. I've got two brothers, so I remember watching this slam dunk contest happen, and then we had the Nerf goal in our bedroom, and so I remember going to the bedroom, getting a thing of, of tape and, and taping off the ground, and then trying to jump from the tape to get to the Nerf goal, usually re re resulting in us crashing through the closet door and breaking something. But this was this moment for me as a kid that I, could, I remember watching it live, and then throughout my life, watching Michael Jordan play basketball, uh, I wasn't a huge fan of him because my older brother, who's two years older than me, he's what we would call a bandwagon fan. Anybody, got any bandwagon fans in the crowd? You, you won't admit it. A bandwagon fan is the fan who jumps on the team who's always winning. If there's a great athlete, they're immediately their biggest fan. And so my older brother was a bandwagon fan. When Jordan started winning, when the Bulls started winning, he went from being a random fan to like diehard Chicago Bulls, Michael Jordan fan. So he was cheering for them, wanting to see them win. I decided as a good little brother, I was going to cheer against them because I didn't want my brother to get the joy out of being a bandwagon fan and taking credit for someone that he didn't deserve to take credit for. So that was my childhood with Michael Jordan, recognizing his greatness, kind of cheering against him to mainly make sure that my brother didn't get to enjoy Michael Jordan's greatness. And so about a year ago, uh, there was a documentary that came out called The Last Dance. Anybody watch that? So a few people may have seen it. it. came out on ESPN. It's on Netflix now. It's a documentary called The Last Dance. And, and I remember the commercials coming on, and I got really excited about it just because it, it made me nostalgic of watching NBA back then and of remembering how everything played out. I wanted to watch it again. And so I sat down to watch the first episode, and I remember watching the first episode. And when the first episode ended, I liked Michael Jordan a little bit more than I did when the, when the, when the, before the show began. And then the next episode came out, and I liked him a little bit more and a little bit more. And, and the reason that as, as the episodes went by, every episode that passed, I admired Michael Jordan a little bit more than I did before because the point of the whole documentary is to show you not just his greatness on the court. The point of the documentary was to show all that went on off the court to make Michael Jordan who Michael Jordan was. And so I really didn't know a lot of the background stories of the things that Michael Jordan did training-wise and the things that Michael Jordan said no to while all the rest of his teammates were saying yes to and the lifestyle that he turned down and the devotion that he had to working out and, and getting better. I, I knew he was a super talented guy and I knew that he was the greatest basketball player I'd ever seen. I, I saw the greatness in public, but what I didn't see was the price that he paid to be great. And so that was really the, the point of the documentary. If you, if you watch The Last Dance, it's a documentary about the 90 Chicago Bulls and Michael Jordan, but it's really a documentary about greatness. And it's about this man who had an incredible amount of talent, obviously, but it wasn't his incredible amount of talent that made him who he was. It was his incredible amount of talent mixed with the price that he was willing to pay to be great. 
And so I watched it, and honestly, I walked away from it, and I was inspired by it. And I had to, had to wrestle with cheering for someone that my older brother cheered for as a bandwagon fan, and then me feeling guilty for being a bandwagon fan as well. But I saw this, and, and so when I walk into my office every morning, I look at this, and what it represents for me is the inspiration that watching The Last Dance created in me, which is greatness has a cost to it. The, the whole documentary is showing you the cost that Michael Jordan paid to be Michael Jordan. And it's showing you that greatness has a cost. And so for me, it's this continual reminder of what greatness requires. So I want to talk this morning about greatness because I don't know about you, but but I want to be great. I've given up the basketball dream a long time ago. That's not going to happen. But but I want to be great. And I think as Christians, we may even feel a little bit weird about saying that because remember, the disciples asked Jesus this question about who will be the greatest. And what I want to remind you is that Jesus did not rebuke them for the, their desire to be great. He rebuked them for their definition of what greatness looks like. Right? He wants us to pursue greatness. I want to be a great dad. I want to be a great husband. I want to be a great friend, a great son, a great neighbor. I don't want to settle for average in the things that I do. I want to pursue greatness and know that it's something that God has called me to step into to be what he's made me to be. Right? And so I think a lot of you are in that boat with me that we want to pursue greatness. We don't want to be average. Right? And, and when we get to this aspect, so, so church life, this is a big part of who I am. This is a big part of my life. When I was 20 years old, I decided that I wanted to give my life, not only to Jesus, but I wanted to give my life to see the church be what I think God wants the church to be. And so I go to bed every night, and this is what occupies my thoughts and my heart and my, my, my passions. I want church to be great. Right? I don't want this to be okay. I don't want it to be average. I don't want it to be, you know, we just kind of settle for it. See, I believe that God has a vision for church that is, that is greatness. Right, I want us to look at Acts chapter 2. This is the passage that is a 20-year-old. I was about to give up on church when I read this passage. And I read this passage and all the frustration that I had experienced with church when I read these six verses, something was sparked inside of me where God, it was like God reached down and said, this is what I want my church to be like. This is the greatness that I've called you to, and this may not have been your experience up until this point, but I want want you to make a decision about whether you want to be a part of making this happen or whether you're going to walk away from the thing that I'm calling you to do because it's it's hard and it requires something of you. Look look at Acts chapter 2. This is the story of the early church. Remember last week, 3,000 people heard a sermon and became followers of Jesus on on the, the day of Pentecost. And Acts 2 begins to tell us the early church, this is the first description that we get of this early church in the city of Jerusalem. And listen to how great this is. Listen to the, the, the way that Luke describes this first community of believers, a couple thousand people in the city of Jerusalem. It says, Acts 2.42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and, prayer, and the prayers. And awe came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. And day by day, attending the temple courts together, the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who were being saved. So, so I don't know about your background with church, but I remember, again, when I read that for the first time as a 20-year-old, I read it, and the longing of my heart was, I wish church was like that. I so wish the church was like that. That really wasn't much like my experience of church up until that point. And like I said, I was to a point in my life where I loved Jesus and I wanted to follow Jesus, but I was really wrestling with this thing called the church because it didn't look much like the church I read about in the Bible. And I remember reading this, and it really was this moment where I read it, and I had to wrestle with, that's what church is supposed to look like. This is the church that God had in mind, and am I going to be a part of trying to create that, make that happen, or do I walk away and just give up on it forever? And so I want to talk about two things this morning. I want to call us into this as a church body because this passage obviously tells us what a great church looks like. It's going to give us some pretty specific markers of here's what made them great. Here's the things that God was doing among them and here's the things that they committed themselves to. This is what a church looks like. 
But I want to go beyond that this morning, and, and I want to ask that question, what is the price of greatness? Is there a price that we as followers of Jesus are willing to pay to make that a reality? Is there a price that God is asking us to step into that we can embrace in order to be great? All right, so let me do this first part really quick. And if you watch the daily devotionals, if you want way more uh, Bible teaching and, and going into the, the specific words, that's why we do the daily devotionals. I want to just show you in six words what this church was about. All right, six verses, and you can kind of summarize it in six quick words what this church was about. They, they were a devoted church. Right, verse 42 talks about their devotion to the Lord and to one another. And it says that they devoted themselves in a, in a few specific areas. They were devoted to the apostles' teaching or the apostles' uh, doctrine, is what it says, that these central beliefs of Christianity became the, the hub of, around which they gathered. They were gathered around fellowship to one another. Right? In other words, we're going to live our lives together in deep fellowship. And so there was this both vertical and horizontal devotion that marked the church, that they were now a part of a new family and their relationship with God, their relationship with one another, and it gets into the details of the breaking of bread. They were sitting around tables, not just sharing a meal together, but as they shared that meal together, it was a reminder once again of the broken body and blood of Jesus that that meal was really all about. And then they were devoted to praying the, the prayers. They were praying the normal Jewish prayers, but doing so now with Jesus at the center. And so what makes this early church beautiful, number one, is their devotion. They were a devoted community where they looked at everything going on in their lives, and they said that the top priorities in our lives are, one, our relationship with God, what Christ has done to save us, what Christ has done to redeem us. He's made us sons and daughters, which then makes us brothers and sisters with one another. So we're devoted to one another. But this early church was a devoted church. The, the second verse there tells us that it was a powerful church. And this is one of those places that we read it, and it's hard to even get our minds around. But it says the entire city of Jerusalem were filled with awe, and the word awe there is the word for fear or this, this reverent sense that God was present. And what I want you to see is that in the early church, there was awe or reverent fear that fell over all the people because the apostles were continuing to do the things that Jesus had done before. Right? You may remember that when Jesus was about to leave the disciples in John 14 and John 16, he kept saying these weird things to them like, I'm going to leave you, but you're going to do more works than I do. Right? I'm going to leave you, but it's to your advantage because if I don't go away, I'm not going to send the Spirit to you. But if I leave, the Spirit will come. Right? And, and, and 50 days after the cross, we see the fulfillment of that. Peter stands up to preach a sermon, and in one sermon, 3,000 people in the city of Jerusalem are converted. Right, this incredible spiritual miracle where death to life happens as a result of one sermon. More people respond to Peter than ever responded to Jesus. And then following that, it says that the, the apostles are doing the same signs and wonders in Jerusalem that Jesus had been doing. Right? And so all fell upon the city because the people recognized what, it, what that meant. That when Jesus was present on the earth, it was easy for them to look at him and know God is present but when Jesus ascended back up into heaven, they began to wonder, now that Jesus is back in heaven, has God abandoned us? And is God still present? And so the apostles, through their teaching, but also through the continuation of the signs and wonders that Jesus had been doing, began to demonstrate for them very, very clearly, Jesus has ascended back up into heaven, but his ascension has now sent the Spirit into all of us, right? And God is more present now than ever. So they were devoted. They were powerful. Third, look at what it says about them, that they were, they were a unified church. Listen to the wording. It says, all who believed were together and had all things in common. This, this group of people, 3,000 people, become a family. And remember, these were Jewish people in Jerusalem who left Judaism to become Christians. What that means for them was that they walked away from literally everything to follow Jesus, a Jewish family, if someone would have converted away from Judaism, considered their, their family members dead if they converted. So this wasn't just a casual decision of, I'm going to become a Christian. This was a, a decision that 3,000 people made that this is so true and so compelling about what God has done that we're willing to literally walk away from everything in order to follow him. And that group of people now becomes this unified one body, this one family who takes care of, of, of each other. And it says that they had all things in common. I, I like to stop here for a moment and, and try to, try to pic, picture that in our minds. That 3,000 people had all things in common. 
What, what I don't think that means is that there were, no, there, there were people in the group, they, they all thought exactly alike, looked exactly alike, had the same opinions about everything. See, when it says that they had all things in common, what it means is that they now had a common central thing in their lives, that Jesus had become the most important thing in their lives, and so all the other things that, were on the, 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 that may have been at one point important to them that could have divided them, those things were now secondary things. Jesus had become everything to them, and so everything else began to fade away, and this church begins to demonstrate what unity looks like. That we may disagree about a lot of other things, we may have different opinions and different preferences, but Jesus is at the center, and so everything else fades behind that. They were a unified church. They were a generous church. Verse 45 talks about them selling their possessions and their belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Like I said, many of these people left their families and left their jobs and, and left everything behind to become a follower of Jesus. And so the community immediately galvanizes and says, hey, anybody in our community that has a need, we're willing to lay down whatever is ours to make sure that their needs are met. That this wasn't forced upon them. This wasn't communism. This was, we're going to look around our community and realize that the needs of my brother and sister are more important than the wants that I may have. And so I'm willing to lay some things down and, and make sure that the people in our family have what they need to live their lives. Look at verse 46. And day by day, attending the temple together, breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts. This was what I would call an active or everyday church. And I love to point this out to them, to point to people. It doesn't say, and every Sunday they gathered for worship, which I'm guessing they did. It says, and day by day, this church was meeting. That this wasn't Sunday morning, let's go to this building and sing songs. It tells us that every single day of the week, every moment of every day was a moment that they were called into to be the presence of God and bring the presence of God to the city. And then look at how it closes, verse 47. It says, praising God, and, and don't miss this little phrase, and having favor with all the people. That is, that is a staggering thing to say. That Luke doesn't say they were meeting day by day and they were having favor with the people who agreed with them. They were having favor with the people who also loved Jesus. It says the entire city of Jerusalem, even though they may not have liked them, understood them, uh, understood at all what they believed, looked at the early Christians and said, you know what, we don't understand what they believe. We don't necessarily like what they believe, but there's something about them that we admire. There's something about them that is so attractive to us despite how crazy we think that they are and how crazy their beliefs are that a dead man rose again. There's something about them that we like being around, that they're, they're winsome and, and attractive. It was a church who was on mission for everyone, every day, everywhere, right? Not on Sunday, come to the building, but every day we go out, not just in the temple courts, but home by home, and the city of Jerusalem just as Jesus predicted, is going to be transformed by this. And then it's going to sweep its way out of Jerusalem to Judea, to Samaria, to, to the ends of the earth, because this is how God has designed his church to work. That it's not one day, it's every day. It's not one place, it's everywhere. It's everyone, everywhere, for everybody. That this message is for everyone. And it says that the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. We're going to read here in a couple chapters that it goes from 3,000 to 5,000. And Luke is just chronicling the report of the growth of this thing, that the Spirit of God has come and fall upon the people. The people have received him and now are walking with him. And it's this picture of the church, again, that when you read it, it's just one of those passages that strikes you with the beauty of it. That this is what church was like. Right, at least for one day, at least for one moment in time, this is what church was like. And so again, when, when I read this passage still, there, there's two things that hit me. And the first is, is the beauty. of like, man, this is, this is it. Like, th who wouldn't want to be a part of a church like that? Who wouldn't give their lives for a church like that? That's what church is supposed to be like. So the first thing that hits me is, is the beauty of it. The second thing that hits me is frustration. And, and questions of, man, why is the church that I've experienced not like that church? Right? I remember being 20, and that was the exact question I wrestled with. That I believe that this is true, and I believe that this is what God wanted, but it feels like this is not how I would describe my church experience. And then I began to talk to more and more people through college, and then I became a pastor. and began to walk my way through trying to lead this thing called the church. The more people that I talked to, the more they began to describe the exact opposite of these words. 
And it was this weird spot to be in. Some of you are in occupations that don't have good reputations. Pastor is one of those. So when I tell people that I'm a pastor, every now and then someone's really happy. A lot of times they look at me and they walk the other way. Right? They don't want to talk to me. And it's because the church usually isn't known for those things. I think the church collectively is known for a lot of times the opposite of these things. So if you talk to people, they don't think about devotion. They think about lukewarm. It's this place where people kind of go, and I know that they talk about Jesus, but their lives really don't look like it, either vertically in their devotion to the Lord or horizontally in their devotion to one another. Christianity and church can seem like this really lukewarm thing to a lot of people. It, it doesn't feel like this powerful thing. It feels like this powerless thing where people get together and kind of go through these religious rituals together. It doesn't feel like this unified thing. It feels like this incredibly divided thing, right? When, when you drive around our city, it doesn't feel like the church is unified. It feels like we're divided. Then when you get into the, the life of a church, just one local church, you discover how many fractures there are even in the middle of a church of people who are trying to love each other. And most people see that and they say, I don't see a, a united church, I see a divided church. I don't see a generous church, I see a self-focused and, and stingy church. I don't see this church that's active every day and everywhere. I see a church that does stuff on Sundays and then kind of closes their doors for the rest of the week. I don't see a church that's for everyone. I see a church that's really for the insiders, that if you're one of us, they will take care of you, but everybody else, they're kind of just on their own. And so I remember feeling that and wrestling with that, and I don't know if that's true to your experience. Hopefully not. I hope there's some of you who would say, you know, I've had the exact opposite experience. I've, I've had a devoted, powerful, unified, generous, every day for everyone church all my life. Praise the Lord if that's the case. But more and more people that I talked to, the more I heard this, this story of, man, I love Jesus. I really want to follow him. But this church thing I'm, I'm wrestling with because the church that I read about in here doesn't seem to line up with the church that I've been a part of in, in the world. And so I remember when I began to ask people this question, there were a few people that I trusted spiritually enough to verbalize that to. Because for a while I felt that, but I felt guilty expressing that out loud. And finally there were some people in my life that I trusted enough to ask the question. I actually went to seminary, and when I went to seminary, I said, I'm going to go to seminary to learn the Bible and to, to, to dig into Scripture, to know God more, but I don't want to be a pastor. Right, I want to go to seminary to learn, and then I'll go do missions. I'll do whatever God has for me to do except for church. And a lot of you know if you ever say that to God, it's usually the thing that you're going to end up doing. Because I knew that God was calling me to step into something that I was really wrestling with, and the reason I was wrestling with it was because the Spirit was preparing me for some things. But I began to ask that question, and here's the first answer I got. When I began to ask the question, why is the church that I've experienced so different from the church in the Bible, the first answer I got was this, that when you read the book of Acts, it is not prescriptive, it is descriptive. It sounds, sounds big and fancy, I'll explain it. That when you read the book of Acts, this isn't prescriptive, it's not prescribing what we should be like, it's simply describing what things used to be like. And so there were people who told me that's the way things used to be, and in the book of Acts, not just in this chapter, but in all the chapters, it's a historical description of what happened, not necessarily an expression of what God still wants to happen, right? And so I remember hearing that argument, and it was new to me. And I remember going back to this and, and wrestling with it, that this is, this is just a description of the past, not necessarily God telling us what he wants for the future. And, and the problem is I kept reading, right? I kept reading, and it doesn't say anything like that anywhere in here. In fact, the entire rest of the New Testament seemed to say the exact opposite, that God was trying to show us something that happened then, that praised the Lord that it happened then, but he didn't want to limit it to then. He's, he's wanting us to see something then that the Spirit did and that the people of God participated in to put a picture in front of us of what might be if we stepped into the same things, not, not a description of the past of a God who used to do it that way but no longer does, but a story about a God who has not changed. See, what, what's attractive about the descriptive way of looking at it is this. We're off the hook. Do you see that? There's a lot of power to that argument, that this is the way church used to be, and it's the way that Christianity used to be, but it, it's no longer the way that it is. We're off the hook because our explanation for why church isn't the same isn't about us. God has changed. Do you see that? We haven't changed. It's not our fault. It's not our problem. God used to do things that way. He no longer does things that way. And so it's on him that church isn't the same, not on us. 
powerful argument, I would say very unbiblical argument, because this thing throughout it is saying God doesn't change. He doesn't change. He's showing us a picture of something that the Spirit of God did through a group of people who said, we will pay the price for it. It's worth it. We we will pay the price to make this happen. And so there's a cost that's involved in this. right? It's not about descriptive or prescriptive. And we're gonna walk you all the way through the book of Acts because we wanna be faithful to the text. There are some things that happen in Acts that thankfully only happen in Acts. For example, someone lies about their giving and they drop dead. I'm thankful that that's not usually the way it happens. Right? So there are stories in here that we would say, man, that happened, and thankfully the grace of God doesn't let it happen that way every time, because a lot of us would be in trouble. Right? But for the most part, when I read this book, what I hear God saying is, I want you to see the expression of my heart through my people, and I want you to be a part of it. I still am the same God 2,000 years later that I was now, and you're invited into it. But there's a price to be paid. There's a price to be paid. See, this isn't about descriptive or prescriptive. What this is about is what I would call aspirational versus actual. These can be aspirational values, and some of you have these in your own life. An aspirational value is, this is the year I'm going to get in shape, right? Some of you may have said that. And in your aspirations, you have in mind the six-pack you're going to have, the marathon you're going to run, like all these things. You're going to go to the gym every single morning. That is an aspirational value. I'm going to get in shape. In actuality, you're not in shape, but you aspire to be. And do you see that the road from aspiration, or from actual to aspirational involves a cost? That the aspiration is good, but to get from where you actually are to where you aspire to be, there's always a cost involved. If you have a struggling marriage and you aspire to have a great marriage, that is an incredible aspiration to have. But to get from an actual unhealthy marriage To a great marriage, there's a cost that you have to choose to pay to move from what is actual to what is aspirational. And all these things are that way. A devoted church, a powerful church, a unified church, generous every day for everyone. That these can't just remain aspirational. We can't just read this and say, man, wouldn't it be great if that was true? We have to read this and then be honest about where we actually are. And say, you know what, I don't know that we're there yet. Here's the cost that if we decide to pay this together, here's what it would look like. We can actually move from what we actually are to where we aspire to be. So here's kind of the summary of the the whole sermon. There is a price that must be paid to move from who we actually are to who we aspire to be. And again, that principle is true in so many places in your life. But it's true for us as well. When we read this passage and say, wouldn't it be great There's a price that if we were willing to pay it, moves us from who we actually are to to who we aspire to be. Another way to say it is this, that that many people and organizations never reach greatness, not because they lack desire to be great, but because because greatness comes at too high a cost. Many organizations, many people desire to be great, but when it comes time to pay the price, they say, you know what, I don't know that I want it that much, and they stay where they're at. Because where you are at is way more comfortable than paying the cost to go where God wants you to go and to be what you want to be. And, and so this is where th- this week, as I've, as, I've, as I've got to work on this sermon, I have been overwhelmed with gratitude. Because I've, I've probably preached this passage more than any other passage in the Bible. I did college ministry for a long time. And this was always my lead off of this is what church should be like. Because I would make the appeal, if you've given up on church, would you look back here and begin to press in and be a part of what God wants to do? Because your experience doesn't have to be what your experience has been. You can be a part of actually seeing this thing come to life. I've preached this passage and studied this passage and read this passage, but when I read it this week, something new bubbled up in me. And it's because of what's been going on in this place for the last year and a half. I read this, and I was just flooded with gratitude because as I read these things and as I began to think about the cost that we must, must pay, y'all's faces popped into my mind, and stories of you popped into my mind that for us, I've seen so many of you pay the price to make us what we are today. Right? I've never been a part of a church like this, and I say that completely wholeheartedly. I've never been a part of a church that I'm so proud to call my church than right now. I love this church. When I tell people the story of what happened, I get to tell them the miracle that God has done through a lot of us seeing what God has in front of us and from a lot of us committing ourselves to being the kind of church that God has in mind. 
I got to stand in front of a lot of you in the new members class, 25 of you who are new here. And I got to share the story of what God has done. And it's so fun for me to hear people come in and say, man, this place is incredible. We found something here that we've been looking for for so long. And I get to step back and just thank God for what he's doing because here, here's what I feel. We're not where we're going to be eventually, but we've taken these major steps to being the kind of church that God has for us. And the reason for that is you guys have paid a price. And, and so I want to just say thank you. I, I want to do two things. I want to thank some of you who have paid a heavy, heavy, heavy price to get us to where we are today. And for the rest of you, I want to put in front of you this invitation and this challenge that for us to continue to be what we want to be, not only for us, but for this city. There's a price that we've all got to step into together. See, greatness is costly, but it's worth it. It's completely worth it. And what I want to put before you is, I want to run through really quickly six costs that if we step into together, this place, not just here, but this place, Nacogdoches, is going to be transformed. Because it's the same thing that the Holy Spirit did through believers 2,000 years ago. The Spirit falls on them, and it's a group of people who decide we're willing to pay the price. And God did what God did. So let me give you six costs in this. Number one, it's what I call the cost of devotion. If we're going to be the church that God has in mind, this, this is the cost. It's us saying this, I, I'm all in, and I'm not going anywhere when things get tough. That, that, that's devotion. Devotion. Right? It's, it's covenant language. It's, you can think marriage. The, the best marriages that I know, that's at the center of it. That they stood before their spouse on their wedding day, and they said this, but with way fancier sounding vows, I'm all in. Right? They, they stand there on, on the altar, and they recognize they're a human who's still growing, and they're marrying a human who's still growing. They're all in, and most of them who've really thought about it realize that marrying another human is going to make my life messier, and there's parts of them I'm going to see that I didn't see before, and there's parts of me that they're going to see that they didn't see before, but I'm all in, and don't miss that, that line, when things get tough, right? Not if things get tough, but when things get tough, I'm all in. Devotion, like the word that this passage begins with, you saying that to God, and then you saying that to the people around you, that is the foundation of, of a church, it's you saying, God, I'm in with you, and I'm going to follow you and do what you call me to do and say what you call me to say. And whether I like it and understand it or, or even in these seasons where I fight against it and don't like it, I'm in and I'm not going anywhere. And then that you would look at other people, other believers in the body and say, listen, I'm all in. And I want to follow Jesus with all my heart and I also want to commit myself to fellowship, to, to an actual family relationship with you. And I'm doing that not thinking that you're going to have your act together. I'm doing that expecting that if we get closer together, I'm going to see the worst parts of you and you're going to see the worst parts of me and our job in each other's lives is to point each other back to Christ that we may grow into who we're supposed to be. D this devotion. And, and when I was thinking about this and, and praying about this, there were people's faces that popped into my mind. And I may embarrass some of you, but I'm going to say it. Five years ago, Paul Hagler was one of the most devoted men and friends I've ever seen where we were going through a tough time at, at our church, and Paul stepped up, and th these were his words. I'm going to follow Jesus, and I'm going to be true to the people around me no matter what. And then Garth Hens and his family and Josh Evans and th this early group of elders at, at, at Mosaic came together, and this was the commitment. This is going to be hard. But this isn't the easy way to go, but we want to commit ourselves to the Lord, that we think this is the direction he's leading. We want to commit ourselves to each other, and when things get hard, we're not leaving. And little did we know that the same thing was going on over here at a church called Oak Grove, where there were people who decided we're in. Right? We're not in when things are good and out when things are bad. We're not Fairweather fans. We're not the bandwagon people. We are in in our relationship with God, and we are in with each other. And so many of you know the stories and know the people, the, the, the Bales and the Boblets and the Mussers and, and, the, and Ron Clonch, this whole group of people that have devoted themselves to God and to one another. See, there, there's people here who have paid a price for a long time now to make us what we are. And as I read this passage, I was so grateful for the devotion that people have shown and saying, listen, God, this isn't going to be easy, but I'm in. I'm, I'm devoted. See, God wants us to, to be a devoted church, and this is what it takes. There's, there's so many other stories that I'm leaving out, but people who say to him and to each other, I'm all in, and I'm not going anywhere. Pri cost number two, the cost of power. 
And I want you to, to, to wrestle with this for a little bit. The, the cost of power. What is the cost of being a powerful church, of being a church where people come and know that God was present? Here's how I word this. That I will seek the presence of God in private so that I can demonstrate the power of God in public. If we would make that commitment, this isn't just about we want to go out and do magic tricks in Jesus' name. Right? We want to show off that we've got power. This is about people understanding that God is present because his power is present. And if we will follow the pattern of Jesus who retreated to be with the Father, who retreated to pray and to be with him in private so that when he went out in public, everything just overflowed out of him to the people around him that he passed it off to the disciples and told them, I want you to pull away and retreat and be with the Father. And then I want you to advance the kingdom and know that you have the same tools at your hand that, that I used to build the kingdom originally. That we will be people who, who are, are people that pull away to seek God's presence in private so that we can d- demonstrate his power in public. Right? There, there's a cost to be paid. Right? It's not like you just get to go out and do ministry and from day one you're great at these things that are, are new to you. The cost is, man, I'm going to wake up early. I'm going to spend time alone in fellowship with my father, not to get something from him, but to be present with him. That I'm going to learn how to plug into his presence so that when I go out, the power that flows through me is just simply his presence flowing through me so that other people know that he's present as well. And again, as as I thought through it and and prayed through it, people and names and specific circumstances where people have, have, have demonstrated God's power to me just began to overflow. The first name that came up, and I don't know if he's here this morning, but Jesus Tobias, that's who came to mind. Is Jesus here? He's sleeping in. Real, real powerful. No, he's a nurse. He's a nurse. He's traveling. But if you know Jesus, I don't know how many times Jesus has walked up to me and said something that would have been extremely awkward for most people to say, but he took a chance and he said it anyway. And it was exactly what I needed to hear that day from the Lord to encourage me and to, and to challenge me to keep walking forward. If you know Jesus, he texts me regularly things that he's praying for for me. And it's really awesome because his name's Jesus, so it looks like it's coming from Jesus. And so I read it. I just, I just read it directly from Jesus and, and assume it's him. And usually it works. It aligns really well. But he's a guy who takes the risk of, man, I'm going to step out. And because I spend time with God in, in private, I believe that God's giving me some things to go out and give to other people in public to edify them and to encourage them and to let them know that God is present with them. Right? Not, not just in the gifts of the Spirit, but there's people that came to mind. I see the fruit of the Spirit that just overflows in their life. Marshall Gorham, last Sunday morning, was sitting behind me. And as I was getting ready to preach, he just leaned forward and wrapped his big MMA-style arms around me, and he prayed over me. And it was a little thing, but it was a big thing. That someone would take a moment to pray and to, to let me know before I get up here that God is with me. I think about Ron Clonch. I watch him go serve kids uh, on the weekend. And, and being a man who could very easily check it in and say, you know what, I've, I've done my time. I've served faithfully. He's not giving up early. Right? He's going to continue to serve and love people, and the fruit of the Spirit is going to flow through Ron. Think about Brian and Katie Trotty. They, they go into the city and love people and have uh, teenagers hanging out at their home constantly because the power of God flows through them publicly because they spend time with God privately. Right? This is a, the cost of power that we're going to be a people who seeks the presence of God in private and trust that as we do that, that God's power will be demonstrated through us in public in small ways that maybe no one would notice, that in these major ways that people would just stand in awe of, that God showed up in a way that we couldn't explain. Cost number three, what I call the cost of unity. I will celebrate and collaborate with believers who are different than me rather than compare and compete with them. That's this this commitment that we want this place to look like heaven. We don't want to all look the same. We don't want to all think the same, dress the same, listen to the same kind of music. Right, unity is us saying we have all things in common. Jesus is at the center of this thing. We want to be a unified body that we're one, we're, we're together around Jesus, not just we're, we're kind of all dressing the same and looking the same. And, and I was thinking about this one, and, and Tiki Perkins came to mind, who I've watched for 10 years make this the passion of her heart, not just at a church like Mosaic where we can learn to be a family in this room, but in this city, she longs more than anything else for the believers in this city to be a family and to learn to set aside secondary things and say, listen, here's what we have in common. Jesus, he loves you. He saved you. Follow him and then find a church to plug into. But be a part of the family of God. Be unified around what God is calling us to, to, to step into. 
Right? It's so easy for us to compare and compete, to look at other people and feel threatened by them, and then to put walls up. And what a, what a healthy church looks like, driven by the Spirit, is that that begins to go away. We don't compare and compete. We look at each other and say, man, you look like Jesus in a way that I don't. And I'm so thankful that you're here. And, and you demonstrate some things that I can't do on my own. We celebrate and collaborate rather than compare and compete. Cost number four, the cost of generosity. That, that I will live an open-handed life and allow God's resources to flow through me. There's something that happened in the Garden of Eden where people went from having open hands and God was giving them everything that they needed all the time. See, the Garden was a place of provision. It was a place where they had an abundance of all that they needed. And when sin entered the world, humans went from abundance to scarcity, to this place where we got really afraid that now there's not going to be enough of all the things that we need. And what that's created in a lot of us, we go through life with a tight grip on everything, our finances, our relationships, our kids, everything. Because we're living with this scarcity mentality that there's not enough of the things that I need. And so when I see something that I need, I'm going to grab it and hold on to it and make sure that I have enough. And a generous life just looks like you opening your hands back up and saying, God, I believe that you're a God of provision. I believe that you're a God of abundance, that you never have left me hanging. You tell me that I'm going to have enough for today and that I don't need to worry about tomorrow because you're the God of tomorrow. And so I'm going to live an open-handed life where the things that you give me aren't for me to grab my hands around and grip onto. They're for me to hold and then make sure they get to the right place. Right? That's stewardship. That you're going to let your resources flow through some people that you trust who keep an open hand so that the people who have needs have their needs met by, by us. And again, name after name after name and face after face go through my mind when I read this one. Jeff and Jackie Batters, day one. We're trying to figure out where church is going to be. And Jeff says, I've got a barn. You're welcome to come, come hang out there. And we probably destroyed and wrecked his barn. We had a kids' ministry upstairs with a bunch of animal heads. And our kids got really confused about a lot of the Bible stories in that day. <laughs> but they, they just opened up their home and said, hey, this, this is a place you can use. This is yours. Use it. Our, our microchurch leaders who've opened up their homes, the Batters, the Evans, the Haglers, Carol Boyette, Joe Musser, Autry's, Hinz's, Tobias's, Trotty's, every single week are opening up their home and saying, hey, what we have is for the kingdom. Let's use it. So many of you who give financially to make this place happen, so many of you who give to make this building project happen, you've looked and realized God has given me his resources, and so I'm going to steward them well. I'm going to trust him that he's going to let his resources flow through me, and I can trust him that I'll have what I need and that he's given me these things to meet the needs of others. Right? It's the, the cost of generosity. The, the cost, number five, of being an everyday church I love this one, that I will not just go to church on Sunday, I'll be the church every day, that we have a group of people that begin to understand as much as I love this hour and a half, as much as I love this place, this place is not meant to be it. This isn't all that we do. This is a place that we come together and then send people back out so that Monday through Saturday, you are active in the city being the church, not just coming to a place that we, that we call church. Uh, I got to interact a couple years ago in a, a class that I did with a pastor from Africa, and he renamed his church The Garage. And it took us a while to figure out why he did that. And he said, I wanted my people to know that when they came here, this isn't the parking spot. This is the place you get tuned out, tuned up to get sent back out. And so he said, this, this is what it is. We're, we're here. We're going to get filled up. We're going to enjoy our presence. But this isn't the point. This is the garage. The, the road is out there. The race is out there. I'm going to send you out. See, this commitment to being an everyday church that we're going to every single day of the week recognize that God has sent us out into the city to, to let other people experience the presence of God. And again, people come to mind all over the place. Microchurch leaders that I've already mentioned, uh, Brent and Ginger Stevens, who saw a need for a counseling center in our city. And we got to see it go from this idea that they prayed about to this reality where day after day people are going to them, finding the healing they need in so many areas of life. That this everyday idea that this is not just about Sundays, the teachers in this room, Right? God knows more than anybody, every single day of your life's a challenge. And I've seen so many of you who teach and who invest your lives in kids, and you do it not because the paycheck is awesome, because I've heard that it's not. You don't do it because it's like, man, this is going to make every day easier and happier. You do it because you recognize this is a way that I can invest my life into some kids who need someone to invest in them, that I can be the church in a place that a lot of these kids would never come to church at the cost of being an everyday church. And then finally, the cost of mission, that I will continue the mission of Jesus. And listen to this one. 
I will continue the mission of Jesus. And if you want to know what Mosaic's about, I think this one summarizes it about as well as anything. That I will continue the mission of Jesus and remember that the church exists for the people who are not yet with us. That the church exists, that the mission of Jesus was to seek and save the lost. And as much as we enjoy each other, I love the fellowship of believers. I love even more the fact that there are believers who get together. And when we get together, we don't say, man, this is it, close the doors. We get together and pray and dream and think about, man, how can we go out and do what Jesus did and seek and save the lost? And so again, this long list of names comes to mind. Uh, First person that jumped to my mind was Carol Boyette. Carol leads a microchurch where believers come together and the ladies pray at her house on Thursday. We were in a meeting a few weeks ago and she asked me the question, is it okay if I prayer walk my neighborhood and then invite the neighbors in? And I said, you have permission to do that. And it was this, this heart. She said, man, I want the people who are not in our prayer group to feel like there's a place where they can go and just have fellowship. And the community, there's been rich and, and such a rewarding thing. I think of Constance Englinking and the Village Knack. Constance, another one of these people who five years ago, we were meeting in the gym at McMichael, and she came to us with this crazy dream to, to start this place that would be all about giving a place where people who have mental health issues and people who suffer with chronic homelessness have a place to call home and get healthy. And there were so many times that Constance came and shared her vision with me, and I thought, that's awesome. And we prayed. And in the back of my mind, I thought, man, God, you're going to have to really do something here because I love the vision. But there's so many things that would have to happen to make that happen. Go out there today. It's happened. Because Constance said, there's a vision and a dream from God, and I'm willing to pay the price. I'm willing to go do it. And so I could go on story after story after story. One last that that, that reminds me of this, our college ministry. I'm so proud of our college students because I get to see a lot of things that that everybody else doesn't get to see. Uh, We have Mosaic on campus every other week. And it would be so easy for our college students just to show up on campus every two weeks and do a service. They go to the campus for the days leading up to Mosaic on campus and love on and interact with and engage so many students. And these students who showed up at SFA to get a degree interact with someone who's there intentionally and the Spirit of God is using our students to introduce people to Jesus and to new life. And it's beautiful to see. I want to read to you, there's, a, there's a, a, a post that was put on Facebook by a girl named Tylen. She's one of our college interns. And this is what she put on Facebook the night after the last Mosaic on campus where a ton of students responded to the gospel. She put this, God is so good. One of our mottos here is that we don't do this for ourselves. We do it for the ones who are giving God one last shot. For the ones who have never heard of God, who don't believe. Through the long hours and late nights, it's so worth it. Because Jesus is all over the students here at SFA, I'm so grateful to be able to witness it. Watching friends and strangers in their 20s surrender is just so real. So many lives saved, so many chains broken, and I'm praying big for faith in this ministry and the strength to keep showing up for the people who are giving God one more shot. SFA and Mosaic has been the biggest blessing. But there are people who pay the price in big ways and in little ways to say we are the church everywhere for everyone, every day. That's what we're going to be about. See, God is calling us to this. And again, when I read this passage, every time I read it and every time I get to preach it, my heart is stirred again to keep going, to be devoted, to be powerful, to be unified, to be generous, to be active, to be every day, to be for everyone. And I want you to know that I'm so thankful that you that God is up to something amazing here and that these amazing things are happening because many of you have realized this. That greatness is costly, but it's worth it. Greatness costs a price, but we'll never look back and regret the cost we pay. I think we're going to look back and regret the cost we failed to pay and that we shied away from. And so I want to to ask you to stand with me. We're We're going to pray and worship. And really, what I want to do today is just say thank you. I want to say thank you to you, to to those of you who've paid a price to get us where you are. Your hard work and your dedication have created a church that is changing lives. And so I can't help but read this passage and just be overwhelmed by thankfulness because I've seen what God is doing here for a long time and I believe that he's just the beginning, at the beginning of what he's doing. And then for some of you, I just want to give you an invitation. This is not a perfect church. If you ever find a perfect church, don't join it because you would screw it up. All right? That was a joke. I love you. But there's no perfect churches. But there's churches of people who follow Jesus with all their heart and let the Spirit work among them. And for some of you, I think it's time to go all in. Or maybe you've been disappointed and hopefully today you realize that God wants great things for his church. 
and that you have a role to play in that. That he's calling you not to run away and to be angry and bitter at what you've seen, but to step in and say, man, I'm gonna help pay a price to make this be what it's supposed to be. And so, Father, we pray and we thank you for what you've done. We're grateful. We're grateful. We're grateful for who you are, that this is all your plan, to build a people, to build a, a church that's not a building, it's not bricks, it's not stones, it's not a service on Sunday, it's people, it's a family who get to represent you in the world and bring other people in to let them experience the grace and goodness of God. We thank you that you always go first. And so, Father, today, may the motivation to do flow out of what's been done for us, that you devoted yourself to us, that you said, I'm in and I'm not going anywhere, that you, the all-powerful one, spent your power on us, that you, the three-in-one, are this beautiful picture of diversity that we want to, to model, that you are generous and kind in ways that we recognize and in so many that we don't, that you are with us every day. You're the ever-present God, that you're for every single one, that there's not a single person that you don't love enough to pursue and chase down. So we just, we say thank you. We say thank you. We pray that you would make us like you. We love you. We worship you today. We express our gratitude to you. We pray these things in the beautiful name of Jesus. Amen.